Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. The environmental organization We Act, West Harlem Environmental Action, incorporated in 1988, was the first group in New York City, and most likely in the state, to be founded and run by people of color demanding environmental justice for the northern Manhattan community. Peggy Shepard is its co-founder and executive director, and under her determined direction, We Act for Environmental Justice is now known in the United States and worldwide as a leader in advancing the perspective of environmental justice in urban communities. She's my guest today. Thank you. So I'm fascinated by all of this because I really had never connected in the way you have connected um, issues of siting of facilities and development and land use uh, and the environment with people of color in urban communities. It just didn't connect the way you've connected it. When you started, you started because of the unfair allotment, I guess, That's right. of bad facilities in northern Manhattan, right? That's right. We really see environmental justice as um, a civil rights decision making for the environment. And we work to ensure that the communities that are less powerful, less politically active, are not the communities that continue to get all of the pollution uh, and get the higher distribution of these kinds of facilities. So we know that these communities are disproportionately impacted, mm -hmm. whether they're Asian American, African American, whether they're tribal communities, Latino communities. We have studies that document that communities of color and secondarily low-income communities are disproportionately targeted for pollution. So it fascinates me. So what happened back in the days when you first started? It was all because of, it started with a sewage treatment plant? It did. Um, you know, I, uh, after the Jesse Jackson campaign, where I was very active, You're and then political Michael activist, Ferrara, right? I was a political and activist. a great feminist. <laughs> I absolutely was, with the National Women's Political yeah. Caucus. Um, I became a Democratic district leader. Uh, I ran with Chuck Sutton uh, in West Harlem, and we ran on a platform of bringing different kind of younger, more dynamic leadership. And as it turned out, a number of senior citizen uh, ladies who had been active in the community. They were the people you went to for voter turnout, or if they were in your building, they were the people who let you know what was going on in the community. They were on the community board. And so they came to me. They supported the campaign of me and Chuck Sutton. And they came to us and said that they needed our younger leadership to really um, advance key issues in the community. And it so happened that at just about the time we were elected in 86, that the North River sewage treatment plant began operating. And the community thought it was about jobs. And they came to me and said, are you going to get us jobs there? So in fact, Chuck and I went on WLIB radio, which was still there at the time. You know, it was a big yeah. uh, popular talk show. And we told everybody, go down to DP for a job. <laughs> well, DP wasn't very happy with us for that, but 30 people were hired. And then of course, once the plant actually began operating, um, and maybe nine months later, we began to realize that the issue was odors and emissions that were making people sick. So we then began an eight-year organizing campaign to hold the city accountable for making this right. And of course, a lot of these issues are very political. And Mayor Koch was the mayor then. And let me just say that the North River plant was- What street is it on? It's between 135th and 145th, 138th and 145th streets in the Hudson River, oh, right. right off of Riverside Drive. And so it was mandated by the federal government to clean up the Hudson River. There was a time when you flushed the toilet and all of that went right into the Hudson. It was not swimmable, the ecosystem was dying, and so this plant was mandated. But sometimes there are unintended consequences. And so there were air quality issues that the community was very concerned about. And so we began this eight-year organizing campaign. Um, a lot of the residents along Riverside Drive were the most active. And Franz Leichter was our state senator back there. He was very active. He got passionately involved with this issue with Chuck and I as the Democratic district leaders. 
and uh, we began working to hold the city accountable. And so over an eight year period of time, we were able to do that. When David Dinkins came in as Manhattan Borough President, that was really important because David had lived uptown. Mm -hmm. So he really knew the impact of this on residents and he felt that impact personally. And so he paid, uh, gave a contract to Barry Commoner, the oh, wonderful great. national yeah. environmentalist who died uh, two or three years ago. And Barry Commoner came in and did a report on the operations of the plant. And so for the first time that really armed us with data that we could better understand how that plant could be operated um, so that it was a good neighbor mm -hmm. and what we needed to mandate in terms of maintenance and staffing for it to operate properly. And so that was a, a real milestone in that organizing campaign. And then of course David Dinkins became mayor and he said there's a problem, we're going to fix it. Uh, Al Appleton, who uh, was a strong environmentalist, became head of the Department of Environmental Protection and he said we're going to fix it. And uh, they did, but we felt that it was important to have a court and a legal mandate. So we went to court to sue our good friend, Mayor David Dinkins, who we love, <laughs> um, to ensure that when he was no longer there, we still had a mandate around this plant. And so um, on the last day of the Dinkins administration, there was a lawsuit settlement that gave a $1.1 million environmental benefit fund to the community for environmental concerns and committed $55 million to fix what was a brand new plant. And thus you were born. <laughs> and thus we were born because once we were going to sue the city, we said, well, um, we've got to really have an official organization. And uh, so we, in 1988, um, organized officially um, also on that date, March 1988, we sued the Metropolitan Transit Authority for building um, right. another bus depot in the community. Because, you know, once you begin to be sensitized to these kinds of issues, you begin to look around your community. It pops all over. <laughs> and then you recognize all of these other problems. And so we realized that with this new bus depot that the uh, MTA was building, that we were going to end up housing in all of northern Manhattan neighborhoods one-third of a very dirty diesel bus fleet. And so that began an 18-year organizing campaign to get the MTA to convert their buses to natural gas and to hybrids. And so now we have one of the cleanest bus fleets in the country. And <laughs> that local campaign meant that the entire city fleet was cleaned up and so benefits were brought to the entire city. That is just amazing and you had other facilities too that were not desirable as That's you right. said that they all popped up. Did you compare your district with other districts? Of, well you had to I guess with other districts of the city. That's right and we began to do uh, geographic information systems mapping of where all these polluting facilities were and then by about the same time we began to see an asthma epidemic. And so we began to reach out to researchers at Columbia University School of Public Health and Harlem Hospital. And we said, you know, can you tell us whether there are um, more people coming from West Harlem zip codes because of this, you know, the air quality um, who might have asthma? Are you seeing that in the emergency room? And two years later, you know, studies take a while, we got the answer. And the answer was that residents in East and West and Central Harlem had asthma at three times the rate of other communities in New York City and in the country. And so that again gave us um, more documentation to press even harder to clean up the bus fleet, to clean up air quality because we had um, this significant asthma problem. And we know that um, diesel and uh, various air pollutants exacerbate and in some cases might actually cause asthma. So you're a double uh, combo because you have the instinct to know what's going on, but you're now a great believer in data to prove what your instincts are. Absolutely, and not only instincts, you have a, but- do you, do you have a continuing relationship with the Mailman School? We have Public a continuing Health? relationship that's now 16 years old. 
Um, we are um, a co-principal co investigator of the Columbia Children's Environmental Health Center, which has been very important in looking at the impacts of air quality on pregnant women and their uh, newborn children. And so those children have been followed now for about 14 years. And so we can really um, look at the impact of air pollution on the pregnant mom who was wearing an air pack, uh, backpack air monitor, so we know what she was breathing in. And we could um, you know, take cord blood at birth and then follow the children to better understand that they were being uh, sensitized in utero to a variety of air pollutants as well as indoor uh, pest allergens that we now know exacerbate asthma and um, also some of these uh, asthma triggers have led to uh, increased risk of obesity. So those studies that took place in Central Harlem and the South Bronx have been very important in um, us pushing better policies at the city council, state, and federal level. When you began, were the general environmental organizations helpful to you? Yes. Uh, actually, the Natural Resources Defense Council oh, yeah, they were, uh, oh, oh. were our pro bono council, uh -huh. um, as well as Paul Weiss, Rifkin, and Wharton uh, supplemented um, their work. And they were very important um, in, in working with us and assisting us and helping us with the information and the legal assistance we needed. When did the movement of calling it environmental justice, when did that become a cohesive national, international movement? Well, you know, back in 1985, um, there was a uh, toxic landfill that was going to be sited in North Carolina. And Ben Chavis, who was with the United Church of Christ for uh, Commission for Racial Justice, was very active with that fight. And that community in the South saw this uh, environmental racism as another element of the racism that they felt they had experienced in housing or through uh, police uh, relationships. And so they called it environmental racism. And so um, back in 85, that's when the term started uh, floating to communities that we were really dealing with being targeted um, for pollution, which we felt was uh, racist and that we were seeking environmental justice. We were seeking a more equitable distribution of polluting uh, sources and facilities, and in fact wanted to find solutions so that no community had to bear that burden. And it's different though from <coughs> NIMBY movements of not in my backyard. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we can certainly point to having the lion's share of the problem, and we're saying we also need some of those benefits. So when parks were starting to be built, around the city, around Manhattan, and we had 125th Street with a fairway parking lot and with the, you know, you know, trash strewn everywhere, we said we want to be part of this um, rejuvenation of the waterfront. We want to have, we want our families to have access to this beautiful resource, the Hudson River, and to that beautiful benefit where they can go and have active recreation and, uh, and have beauty. And so we started um, a, a campaign to develop a community-based planning process to bring a park to the 125th Street Harlem Piers. So every, you've taken everything, participatory democracy, <laughs> participatory planning, right? Mm -hmm. The whole com combination is really what comes out of your organization. Community-based planning is an important way we do our work. Uh, we believe that the folks who are most affected uh, should have environmental decision-making um, that affects their communities uh, and their lives. So we work to organize community, create leaders, um, develop leadership programs to ensure that uh, low-income residents and residents of color can adequately engage in decision-making that affects their communities. Do you have young people involved? We do. Um, we started out with something called the Earth Crew. It was a wonderful group of junior high and high school students. And uh, we actually have uh, one of those uh, students who's still with us. He's now about 33. 
and he does all of our IT work and our GIS mapping. Um, half of our staff is under the age of 35. So um, we have youth, we have diversity, and uh, we think that that's critical to having a strong environmental movement. And do they have a passion about uh, the climate change? Oh, absolutely. Um, we first began to see the impacts of climate change um, in an important way um, after the hurricane hit uh, New Orleans. And we began to understand how climate uh, extreme events can really um, rip civil society apart. And we still see the vestiges of that in New Orleans, where so much of that society has never come back together again. And we've been able to see that um, through Hurricane Sandy and the impact that had on New York City, on so many of our um, oceanfront communities. And so we know that um, some of the small homeowners, some of the people in public housing were the hardest hit. We also know that many of them are not back in their homes, the small homeowners. And we know that many of them in NYCHA housing are still living with mold and other kinds of allergens um, and living in apartments in disrepair. So we understand what extreme weather events can really do to our lives. We also know that heat will be the most extreme weather event that probably hits us every single year. And so we've got to be on guard and we've got to develop policies so that the most affected, like our senior citizens, like our young people, like those who have chronic illness, are not disproportionately impacted by heat uh, events. And so we've got a plan for that as well. So that's where your policy advocacy comes in. Absolutely. We're now working um, over the next four months to develop a Northern Manhattan Climate Resiliency Plan where we are engaging residents in climate scenarios called serious games. And we'll be working to engage them to, so that we can better identify the challenges as well as community identified solutions and then engage uh, city government um, as partners and stakeholders so that we can begin to affect policy uh, for our communities. So you will go in and, and present the policy recommendations and do all the pressure and the lobbying and the... Absolutely, and the but we've also made city agencies partners here. in our process. And so yes, many of yes. them have committed mm -hmm. to being a part of our process. Uh, which is very important. Mm -hmm. And we know that when the state and city engage with residents, better things happen for all of us. You're on a lot of boards, aren't you now? I am. <laughs> you I are am. a busy person. I am very busy. <laughs> um, it's important to, um, to be able to provide a perspective for low-income communities on boards that may not have that kind of diversity. So I am a board trustee of the Environmental Defense Fund. I've served on the State Audubon Board as well. I serve on the New York League of Conservation Voters and the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance as well. Um, and certainly have been on advisory groups for Plan YC. Um, for the different city and state projects. That's right. So you're directly involved. Directly involved. And we've started an office in Washington uh, two and a half years ago that's mainly focused on climate resilience, uh, focuses on EPA rulemaking, air quality, and uh, the new clean power rule. Do you know people in similar groups in other communities? And Absolutely. Exchange experiences and theories and all of that? Absolutely. Um, this is truly a multiracial, multiethnic movement. And back in 1991, when we all came together at a summit to hammer out the 17 principles of environmental justice, um, the mandate was to go back to your community, organize a grassroots space, and we began to share best practices and challenges um, through networks around the country. So there are networks of tribal folks, indigenous environmental network, of Native Americans around the country. There's an Asian American network. There are networks in the Southwest, in the Northeast, in the Far West. And so we have been able to organize through those networks and stay in touch. 
And one thing my office in Washington has done is to help develop a 33 group. Um, it's called the Environmental Justice Leadership Forum on Climate Change. Mm. And so we're working to have a national uh, focus and consensus around climate policy. So interesting. Do you take positions on things like the Keystone Pipeline, fracking, all those different things? Um, yes, we do, where <laughs> we can all uh, have consensus nationally. As you know, that can be difficult. But yes, we have taken a position on the Keystone Pipeline, on fracking, um, on a variety of issues, you know, Arctic exploration, mm -hmm. uh, cap and trade, on a variety of issues that affect um, our communities. And are we now diversifying the established groups? Are we bringing them into the whole question of, econ of environmental justice and, and who's on their boards and what they're doing? We are making progress. <laughs> and let me just say that the large green groups um, understand that they have not been great on diversity. They understand that we all need to win big environmental, uh, big environmental initiatives. In order to do that, we have to have everybody at the table. We have to have everyone's perspective, and we need to include the challenges that affect all communities. So I'm on the board of Environmental Defense Fund. I'll just speak for them and say that they have developed a five-year diversity initiative. They are moving ahead to uh, really advance some strong diversity initiatives, and I'm very happy to be working with them on that. It's great. They've always been a great ally, haven't they? They have. Yeah. And is the concept of environmental development and, and sustainability mixed in with jobs? Absolutely. Has that become, an, I mean, is that now really taking root? <laughs> <laughs> We hope so. We know that at the state and federal le level, there have been appropriations for green jobs. Um, we have not seen that be uh, as robust as we'd like at the state level or at the federal level. So our advocacy is still extremely important. But we hope that the de Blasio and Cuomo administration will uh, appropriate more of an investment um, for that kind of work. And your congressional delegation, do you work with them? We do. <laughs> uh, Charlie Rangel is, is my congressman. And uh, we go to Congress and we do briefings with the Progressive uh, Caucus as well as the, the Black, uh, Latino, and Asian Caucus. And we certainly um, have been pushing a variety of initiatives. But again, we have a very conservative Congress right now. so. Um, until we have some changes, we may not get uh, the more progressive environmental legislation that we need. Uh, but EPA has been pushing forward to regulate power plants and greenhouse gas emissions. We have a very strong uh, Plan YC, um, One City program, as de Blasio, mm -hmm. uh, Mayor de Blasio calls it. And that's a strong plan. And we'll hear more about that being rolled out uh, on Earth Day. But uh, the advisory board has been meeting, and that plan is progressing. And I think um, there will be much more community-based input into that plan. And so we're very optimistic. You know, you've been honored by a lot of organizations, and I can well understand why. You started all of this without an environmental background, right? That's right. Um, I started out, I'm an English major. <laughs> I did not major in sciences. Uh, I started out as a newspaper reporter and a magazine editor, and then I went on to work in political campaigns and uh, in state and city agencies. And uh, it was when I became a Democratic district leader that I began to see the environmental impacts on my community and where I lived, and uh, I began to take action. Did you come, I'm always interested in where people come from that they have this incredible drive and instinct and, um, I, I don't know, talent, I guess. Was your family very interested in the community? Yes. You know, my father was uh, the only black obstetrician in Trenton, New Jersey. And uh, I used to, I remember when I was a little kid making house calls with him. He started a, a free health clinic. Um, my mother was very uh, active and volunteer uh, organizations. And, you know, when I think back, um, as a nine or 10 year old, I was starting little groups and, 
you know, that didn't do very much, but I was always starting little clubs. And um, I think in the Jesse Jackson campaign, when I was doing public relations, and I was able to work with delegates all over the city, especially down in the village, mm -hmm. the village independent Democrats. <laughs> and I saw how active they were, how strong advocacy systems created better neighborhoods. And so when I became a district leader in Harlem, I began to see that we had a lack of advocacy. We had um, so many problems and challenges. And so I felt that um, perhaps it was time not to simply be behind the scenes um, the way I was in other campaigns, but to begin to develop my own initiatives and sense of uh, political activism. And the whole concept of concern about the community from when you were a child, I guess, concern about other people and empathy for people suffering or something like that, is that an important thing in, in a develop, child's development? Oh, I think so, you know, because when I was growing up, um, in the early 50s, um, commu you know, neighborhoods were still pretty segregated. Mm -hmm. And so we all lived together, you know, the, you know, cop lived next door to me and, you know, the electrician lived down the street and we all lived together. You know, my grandfather worked in an Acme rubber factory and um, ended up dying of, you know, as asbestosis. Um, so we all lived together. We all understood the challenges that all of the families were, were having in our neighborhood. And definitely that made an absolute difference in the way that I see neighborhoods. Um, I live in the West Harlem neighborhood. I've been there since uh, the early 80s. And um, it's been um, such a vibrant, dynamic neighborhood. It's changing now. Um, it's getting gentrified. And it's important that we advocate uh, to keep affordable housing there and to um, make sure that we have the resources we need for all the diversity of residents who are there. Well, Peggy Shepard, we've come to the end of this interview, but it has been remarkable, and your work is remarkable, and um, I hope we keep track of what you're doing and you come back again. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>